This is Robert Montgomery speaking. From the nation's capital has come a new epic of American courage and sacrifice. America's greatest adventure in polar exploration. This is a tale of men and of their willingness to endure hardship and risk life above and beyond the call of duty in the service of country and humanity. For brevity, the sequence of events has occasionally been rearranged. The President's cabinet approved the expedition. As Secretary of the Navy, James V. Forrestal explains the reasons for the enterprise. There is only one untouched reservoir of raw materials left in the world, and that's in the region known as Antarctica. An area larger than the combined area of the United States and Europe. The American government is sending a naval expedition to that region. The purpose is to train our Navy in polar operations so that it may better perform its function of preserving the peace upon the seven seas of the world. Beyond that, the American government is seeking to do its share in the discovery and the release to the world of the unknown treasures of Antarctica in the interests of all mankind. Thumbs up to this gentleman. The secretary has approved our plans, confirming you, Admiral Byrd, as the officer in charge of the expedition, and you, Admiral Cruzen, as the task force commander. And we get everything we need. That makes Operation High Jump the greatest polar expedition in history. Admiral, time is going to be our greatest handicap. By the time we get through this very difficult ice pack, the summer will have ended and the fall will have set in. Never before has anyone attempted to take a fleet of thin-skinned steel ships through 300 miles or more of crushing ice pack. I have great faith in your skill courage and determination. Now, gentlemen. Admiral Nimitz reviews the operation's plan. The expedition will comprise three groups. A central land plane group to explore the interior from Little America, and two seaplane groups, the eastern to map that half of the continental shoreline, and the western to map the opposite coast of Antarctica. After the original orders have been issued, three months of planning are needed to organize the giant venture. This is Robert Taylor speaking. At the world's greatest naval base, Norfolk, Virginia, ships of the Central and Eastern groups are loading. The flagship, Mount Olympus, equipped with powerful radio and radar, will serve as the leader's voice of command. Admirals Byrd and Cruzen come aboard to check staff preparations, food, fuel, and clothing for 4,000 men. Byrd greets staff officers who have fitted out the expedition. Not a few vessels, but a fleet. Officers and men, not hundreds, but thousands and pilots by the score. The chief of staff, Captain Quackenbush, calls up the fleet's youngest recruits to meet the admirals, who name them Running Jump and High Jump. The pups are unimpressed by rank. Running Jump and High Jump are first arrivals from the Chinook Kennels at Wanolancet, New Hampshire, where sailors are learning the art of navigating dog sleds. Everything happens to sailors. But soon they come to understand and to love the huskies. They watch their dogs carefully to see that they have enough to drink and enough to eat. And always at the right time. Dog Watch Blue Jackets practice the patient care that will keep the dogs in prime form. Not only food. Daily attention to their eyes so that they may not suffer the dreaded Arctic snow blindness. And the inevitable vitamin pills. But even dogs can't escape these days of A, B, C, D health. The boys learn all the tricks. Tickling of the throat and a pat on the nose gets the pills down. The dog sleds are the small boats of the Antarctic. Each carries 600 pounds with 10 dogs hauling. Each dog's harness is tailor-made, carefully fitted to avoid the chafing that has been fatal to many a sled dog at below zero temperatures. The husky's paws are equally important. There are canine snowshoes, precisely notched for the pulling claws. In cut-down auto chassis, the sailor drivers finish training. Huskies so often have meant life itself to Admiral Byrd that he calls them his Antarctic Life Insurance Company. From Norfolk, 
Admiral Cruzen sails aboard the Mount Olympus. His crews are a cross-section of the country's manhood. Admiral Byrd will follow later in a carrier, Philippine Sea. The Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind, powerful plow horse of the expedition, backs out. The seaplane tender, Pine Island, is first to stand out to sea. Steaming south via the Panama Canal, the fleet must cover 12,000 miles to reach Antarctica. At the 100th meridian west, the groups are to separate, and the central group proceed to a rendezvous point at Scott Island. This is Van Heflin speaking. Sailing day at San Diego finds the Western Group helicopters practicing final pinpoint landings on the newly installed helicopter flight deck of the seaplane tender Curry Tuck. They are to serve as eyes of the fleet when it buffets through the pack ice, and when need be, to go on rescue missions. For exploration, three Martin Mariners called PVMs with a flight range of 3,000 miles are spotted aboard the Curry Tuck. Ships of the Western Group will proceed 10,000 miles south to the Balleny Islands, 860 miles to the west of Little America. Aboard the Mount Olympus, now heading south in the Pacific, Admiral Cruzen gives a traditional command, and up goes a strange flag. The Jolly Roger, signifying the crossing of the equator and authorizing the ancient shenanigans of the sea whereby all land lovers are painfully presented at King Neptune's court. The veteran shellbacks copperplate the polywogs' interiors with a mixture of cylinder oil and chewing tobacco. Next, the polywogs must kiss the bosun's belly, the only kiss they'll have for many a long month. They wind up with a dunking and a final whacking to warm them up, officers and men alike. Wearing the whiskers of Neptunus Caninus, Ricky, the veteran husky, presides as the pups become doggy shellbacks. The oncoming shadow of the Antarctic intensifies preparations. Bamboo is split for trail marker sticks. These, topped with flags, will form lifelines to guard the men against losing the trail in blinding blizzards. Small details, but vitally important in the wilderness of ice. The dogs are inoculated against infection. Now the serious business of the sea takes over. Danger menaces the fleet oiler, Cacapon. She must fuel the fleet now to lighten her cargo of four million gallons of oil. If storms strike her, plates may warp, rivets shear, and her back may be broken. And ahead are the dreaded Roaring Forties. Deck parties run with hauling lines, bringing over the Cacapon's captain for a conference. Ships are still on course, forging ahead. But the Cacapon salty skippers smell storm coming. Few ships travel this lonely ocean, so there are no weather reports. We've got to finish this job fast, he roars, or we'll be caught in a stiff blow. And blow she does. of life. But below, in sick bay, the surgeons are busy with the injured. Today, with Navy's modern science, 
An injured seaman is soon up and about. We go back now to Norfolk and sailing day for Admiral Byrd. Six DC-3s, called R-4Ds by the Navy, make the longest taxi run in Navy Yard history, each with crewmen riding the tips of their 98-foot wings. Poles and buildings have been removed to clear their way to the 30,000-ton carrier, Philippine Sea. Admiral Byrd will sail the carrier close to the edge of the pack ice, then fly his six 30,000-pound land planes from her deck, 800 miles across the pack to Little America. A daring and dangerous plan. But precedent was made in 1942 by Jimmy Doolittle and his much smaller B-25s, Tokyo-bound from the carrier Hornet. As the Philippine Sea sails on her 10,000-mile voyage, the advance group under cruising has voyaged far south. They sight their first icebergs just above the Antarctic Circle. Careful bearings are taken. For the hulls of these ships are no thicker than was the steel skin of the Titanic. The treacherous ice is the enemy now as then. But danger is the sailor's business. His delight is in preserving home traditions, the Christmas tree and Christmas dinner. TNT Overnight, 50 years of classic films all night long. For love, he'll throw down his... Engines throb, taking the central group deeper into icebound seas. Now by the far-seeing eye of radar, the bridge learns of land ahead. And flag communications passes the word to the fleet. Scott Island, dead ahead. All ships rendezvous. 600 critical miles of their 12,000-mile voyage still to go. The ice pack ahead has been the executioner of many gallant ships. Cruzen summons captains and executive officers for a staff conference. While the staff confers, a small landing boat sets off for Scott Island, named in honor of the heroic British explorer, Captain Robert Fountain Scott, who lost his life a generation ago, trying to fight his way back from the South Pole. In such searching seas, landing is impossible. The boat heads back from Mount Olympus with serious news. Cruzen must abandon his plan for a weather station here on this rugged submarine mountain. Time presses hard. With his operation officers, Cruzen transfers his flag from Mount Olympus to the Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind. For she must take the lead, cut the channels. Admiral Cruzen's battle now begins. Through 600 miles of peril, the Admiral must bring his ships to the open Ross Sea, and thus to the Bay of Wales and Little America. Cruising signals, follow me, and sets a careful course past icebergs. Thar she blows, things a look out. Thar she breaches, close aboard. These huge whales measure up to 80 feet long, and each yields oil worth more than $2,000. The radar watch informs the bridge they have picked up a big ship, a Norwegian whaler, with her killer craft in close company. The Norsemen report the heaviest ice pack in 40 years. This year, they tell the Americans they're staying to the north of the ice. The Norwegian captain urges, exercise extreme caution. The American fleet proceeds. Here is the most treacherous navigation in all the seven seas, with every flow, every bird, a potential killer of ships. Seven-eighths of a bird lies underwater. Its jutting ice foot can slice into a ship like a can opener into a can. Ahead, the sky shows white streaks, the telltale ice blink, the warning reflection in the sky of the great pack. The ships meet their first tabular, 
the tabletop bird found only in the Antarctic. These tabulars are huge chips from the Great Ice Barrier. They measure as long as 40 miles and are counted not in acres, but in square miles. The ships must follow a twisting, turning sea alley, cleared by the icebreaker. The submarine, Senate, brings up the rear. New formed ice, known from its shape as lily pad ice, offers no trouble. It is the bergy bits and the bergs themselves that form the hazard for the submarine. A little Adelie penguin comes aboard as pilot and rides the deck for two solid days. Navy cameramen find new subjects. A group of emperor penguins feeding in the lead. Look out, spot a flock of snow petrels, those hardiest of birds. Admiral Cruzen orders reconnaissance by helicopter and himself boards the plane as observer. For the first time, the helicopter serves as the eyes of the fleet to scout out a way through the ice. Somewhere to the south, Cruzen hopes to locate better going, perhaps a lead heading toward Little America. Beyond the brash ice, at first he can spot only isolated lakes. At last he sees his lead. Reconnaissance by helicopter has paid off. And just in time, for well, the helicopter's gas is running low. The long practice hours of pinpoint landing have not been wasted. The Admiral is safely back aboard. Cruzen changes course to head the fleet toward his lead. No open roadstead here. No channel markers. The turn is difficult for the big ships. Now to the men of the fleet comes one of nature's weirdest pictures. The Antarctic twilight. Eerie greens and pastel blues. Men who look grow silent, but long remember. Nor will they forget the dawns and the seals. to the north wind summons instant help. The submarine, Senate, is caught. The jaws of two ponderous pressure blows are closed in, locking her in a white vice. The submarine is in acute danger of being sunk. All hands realize now that the Senate may never get through. Cruising signals, resume course. Meanwhile, the Eastern Group has steamed to Peter the First Island, 1,250 miles northeast of the main base to be established at Little America. The Eastern Group's seaplane tender, Pine Island, sends a helicopter to scout the rugged coast. Hope is fulfilled when she relocates Scott's 37-year-old camp. This was the base for the ill-fated Britain's expeditions at the turn of the century. While the helicopter waits, the Americans look over the hut, finding only an abandoned sled. But back at the Pine Island, the helicopter meets trouble. Her rotors, heavy with ice, fail. She crashes only a few feet from the safety of the landing deck. Within seconds, the Pine Island's crash boat reaches the sinking helicopter. The rescue crewmen, drilled for just such an emergency, yank Captain Dufek and his pilot safely aboard. Back at the Central Group, danger increases for the submarine. Crushing ice is now riding up over her decks. She is solidly frozen in. is desperate. Clearly
Clearly, she cannot undergo further risks. There are 85 men aboard. The ice locking her in is a solid pressure field spotted with birds. She must be taken back. The north wind cannot get the fleet through if constantly halted to rescue the submarine. Gain by yards now. 
Captain Thomas dares passages that normally he would avoid. It's the critical last round, a straight-out slugging match. navigates the canal in a day. As she heads south in the Pacific, Admiral Byrd devotes all his time to the flight ahead, perilous but of vital importance to naval aviation. Never before have such huge planes attempted carrier deck takeoffs. Never before have wheels and skis been combined in one landing gear. The wheels for deck takeoffs and the skis for landings on ice. The grave risk is that one may interfere with the other and bring disaster. Bird makes the decision. The wheels will have only a three-inch clearance between skis and deck. Upon this will depend the lives of 40 men, and he will lead the way. Triumph at last for Admiral Cruz. The entrance to the Bay of Wales, the famous 400-mile Ross Barrier. The Admiral can now relax. He, an American Admiral, has brought a modern fleet for the first time into the innermost waters touching the great unknown continent of Antarctica. This is an historic moment. At long last, Admiral Byrd has realized his dream of many years of reaching Little America with men and ships of the United States Navy. Reception committee. Hey, gang, hurry up. Look at the big penguins in our bay. Big penguins, bigger than emperors. And big black mountains that move. They walk like us, but not quite the right way. <laughs> Come on, gang. You gotta go see what gives. The big penguins and their big black mountains, the ships, are on 24-hour duty with the first job to secure all mooring lines. Big timbers sunk deep in the ice serve as anchors. They're called dead men in sea parlance, perhaps because they're buried. Slip toggles are rigged for quick release in case ice forces an emergency getaway. Unloading. Reconnaissance planes first, next hauling equipment. The Marine Corps weasels, heavy-duty caterpillars, and trucks, 40 in all. Here are no port facilities, but the Navy shows its self-sufficiency as it did throughout the war in operating at sea without bases or with improvised bases. Here are no docks or roads, yet all freight aboard three heavily laden ships is hauled two miles over the ice up to Little America. Dogs next. A barking, tugging boatload of huskies. And the pups, growing fatter and bigger every day. All are happy with the welcome smell of snow in their nostrils. This is home. This is fun. But this is work, too, for time is short. The dogs must haul their share of the tonnage. Halt. Trouble ahead. Pressure ridges block the way inland to Little America. Even the largest caterpillars are stalled. The call goes out for dynamite crews. Navy's trained demolition teams, seasoned on enemy beaches. They must blast the 50-foot ridges, clear the way to meet the expedition timetable. The ridges are deep. The blasting takes hours.
CBs and their bulldozers follow, smooth out the road for the big cats. In two hours, they bridge crevasses 100 feet deep. And so 10,000 tons of gear, brought down by the cargo ships, start moving up to Little America. Work goes steadily forward. CBs, with all hands helping, use every one of the 24 hours of daylight in the South Pole summer. Caterpillars with snowshoe oversized treads accomplish in hours the work that in old days hundreds of dogs could do only in weeks. Air strips, smoothed out with drags, take high priority. Bird has flashed word from the Philippine Sea, now standing by off the pack ice, that he's ready to fly his R4Ds in. It's up to the work parties to make up the time lost in the pack ice. Up to these men to work while gusty winds drive flesh-cutting gravel-like snow across the open or to dig deep for storehouse foundations. Food dumps grow steadily. Here is the favorite hangout of the veteran husky, Ricky. Born at Little America 12 years before and still hungry. Each hour brings other buildings to completion. Knockdown Wanigans grow magically. And the air headquarters Quonset is ready. Snow blocks are dug out for windbreaker walls. These blocks are the adobe of Little America. Good idea, talks the sidewalk superintendent of the base. Good idea. These big penguins do right well to bear in mind that when she blows down here, she's liable to blow your eyelashes off. The little Adelie shows no fear. What? Smoke? Silly idea. We'll be right back with TNT Overnight. 50 years of classic film. The ships are all but empty. The caterpillars and go devils live up to their wartime good name. Within 70 hours... The CBs are hauling in the last 500 tons of essentials. Only a few more cases to be broken out. The local waterworks is the pride of the CBs. Three GI cans of snow produce one can of water, purest in the world. You keep your furnace going to make steam, which melts snow, which makes water. Simple. Simple, once CB Engineering in Washington had figured it out before ever the first ship left port. And now, the ordered streets of a tent city that is Little America the Port come into being where three days before the primeval snow lay unbroken. The church flag on the first Sunday signifies a pause for prayers. After the last mass, and after the Protestant and Jewish services, the off-duty sailors have but one thought. Transportation has but one terminal, the mess hall, the best dinner of the week, as ancient Navy tradition always has decreed. Admirals and captains wait their turn in the chow line with the men. Inside, plates are loaded. Roast beef, rich gravy, high mounds of mashed potatoes, flaky pie. Life looks up again. A cigarette. Good coffee. Five miles east of Little America, a seal herd, 500 strong, has its feeding ground amongst pressure ridges and in deep crevasses. Ricky, as a pup, played the game of run, seal, run, and he hasn't forgotten. The seal wallops with his tail. Ricky's 12-year-old teeth are not so good on the slippery wet hide of the 600-pound Waddell. Mr. Seal decides he's had enough. He scuttles down his escape hatch to the water below. Chow time. The only seals killed are for dog meat. Especially good because it ensures against scurvy. The pups smell their dinner coming and let their handler plainly know they want it. Right now. They're only a few months old and forever hungry. Yet soon they will be pulling more than their weight in the sledge traces. They like their meat red. We'll fight for it. <laughs> the flagship flashes word by radio to the carrier Philippine Sea. Base ready, weather suitable. On the carrier, six planes, triple checked, are ready for their moment of destiny. Admiral Byrd has given the pilots a final briefing. Everything depends on split-second timing. Pilots, man your plane. No 3,000-foot runway here. Only a scant 300 feet. Jet propulsion is their reliance. Crewmen attach jet containers, four to a plane. These JATO bottles are packed with flaming power. In the critical ten seconds of takeoff, they give the kick-up of two added engines. Bird 
is airborne in exactly 100 feet. Admiral Byrd and his companion plane will try the 800-mile flight first. The others await his orders. At Little America, cameramen and Admiral Cruzen wait anxiously. And there comes Byrd. Cruzen can relax now. His keys work perfectly. The carefully calculated drag of the wheels serves only to shoot up a plume of snow. Bird greets his son, Dickie Jr., first, here following Dad's footsteps. They watch plane number two come in safely. Bird tells Cruzen, good to be home again. Cruzen has urgent news. There's a terrific storm brewing, only ten hours more of safe flying. Bird radios the carrier, launch all planes as soon as possible. By midnight, the Philippine Sea has the remaining four planes ready. They must risk a takeoff in darkness before the terror of the storm strikes. over the pack ice. With frozen death below and weather closing in, navigation becomes tricky. This close to the pole, the magnetic compass is no help. At the base, men scan the gray skies, looking, and finding only the blackness of the approaching storm now visible to the east. If the planes don't make it within an hour, but in they come, one by one, to land in the last remnants of clear light. Each landing is the first on the ice for each pilot. These men are the first ever to fly big planes into the Antarctic. Or on previous expeditions, the planes were freighted in, assembled, and only then were they flown. These Navy and Marine Corps flyers have been bred on stormy going. Their long experience and, above all, the Navy's relentless training in all details brings them in, but with little time to spare. The blizzard hits, 100 miles an hour, scouring across the Sestrugi. In storms such as this, many brave explorers have died.
America the Fourth in full operating commission. The Admiral and the party ride weasels 12 miles south to visit his earliest camp, marked by the radio towers. Little America the First, now 40 feet under the snows of 17 years. And above it, Little America the Second, 25 feet under the snows fallen since 1935. Captain Boyd, United States Marine Corps, ties on a safety line. While Admiral Byrd and three veterans of his previous expeditions watch, Boyd inches his carcass down the old ventilating hatch. It stood 20 feet in the air when it was put up 12 years before. He pokes a stick up as a marker for the main hatch. Now all hands, the Admiral included, will have a chance to go look-see. Below, the old-timers find a lantern that lights at once. No manner of other gear. For here in Antarctica, there is no decay, no rust, no dust, not even germs. Fruits, vegetables, meats, all good after 17 years. Small wonder Bird preaches that one day, Antarctica may be the world's storehouse to keep the seven years surplus for the seven lean years. Bird, bringing with him the old corn cob he'd forgotten in 1930, comes up last. He meets heavy going, but he makes it the hard way and seems to like it. We'll be right back with TNT Overnight. Can men survive in freezing water? Men from Mars, members of a special underwater demolition team, wear the new cold water rubber survival suit. In contrast to these skylocking youngsters eating ice cream in the ice, men in ordinary clothing are paralyzed in six minutes and die very quickly thereafter. Yet these sailors, wearing only underwear beneath their survival suits, stay in half an hour and come up chipper and warm. On the sunny afterdeck of the Mount Olympus, the expedition's prize penguin catch, the big emperors, are living the life of penguin rileys. They grow four feet tall, weigh up to 80 pounds, and are the only creatures who live throughout the year on Antarctica. Eons ago, they flew. In time, their wings evolved into swimming fins. Their deep feathers are the warmest known. Their feet, thick leather-like pads. On these, they lay their single egg and tuck it up within the body feathers for warmth, to hatch it. In captivity, they must have their vitamins. Keeping them alive for the return voyage is quite a problem, for their bloodstreams have no germ resistance. Their necks are ball-bearing. Strangely enough, the smaller captive penguins prefer their fish fillet. They won't eat live fish out of a pail. The rockhopper penguins are the clowns of the Antarctic. Twenty inches high, cocky yellow eyebrows, sassy, and forever hungry. As the men find out, they'll eat their weight in fish every three days. The gathering of scientific data ranks high in expedition plans. Admiral Byrd says goodbye and good luck to an over-ice expedition which is to probe deep into the Rockefeller Mountains, 300 miles southeast. Two LBTs hauling supply sledges strike out into the white darkness. Their mileage checked by bicycle wheel counters astern. In the mountain rocks, they will seek minerals and ancient petrified vegetation. Hourly, they will record important aerological data. But exploration by plane has priority one. A million and a half square miles are to be explored and mapped, and the oncoming winter soon will end flying weather. The wheels come off, but both takeoffs and landings on the ice must be made by skis alone, delicately balanced to feather in the wind, yet strong to stand the shattering shock of landings. Organized exploration on a scale hitherto undreamed of calls for precision timing. Each plane is serviced on exact schedule with 1,200 gallons of high-test gas and with preheated oil tested to function at 80 below. A pressure tank, especially designed for operations in deep cold, pumps the oil into the planes. Daily flights begin. Each plane has a definite sector to explore, a definite timetable, a definite radio report schedule. While the weather holds, flights operate around the clock. For emergencies, the LVTs cache provisions and fuel at the limit of their range. To aviators forced down, to rescue planes sent out to bring them in, these cairns may offer the one hope, and may mean ultimate survival. 1,200 miles to the east, the eastern group vessels and planes 
are exploring the mysterious Phantom Coast. Aboard the destroyer Monson, the commander of the Eastern Group, Captain George Dufek, makes an exploration voyage. He sails close in to Mount Erebus, 14,000 feet above the sea. It is the only known active volcano near the South Pole. Captain Dufek, his mission accomplished, returns to rendezvous with the seaplane tender Pine Island. Personnel transfers to the destroyer must be made by breaches buoy because of rough seas. This officer would probably prefer a boat. The deep roll and the destroyer's outward flaring bow force the handling crew to wait for the exact moment to haul inboard, lest the man be dashed against the ship's side and killed. It is Captain Dufek's turn next. The line is set higher. The seas run stronger. The ships roll dangerously apart. The line slacks, then snaps taut and breaks. And 
to the one with the most sex appeal. At Little America, a warning sounds. The fleet is in sudden danger. It is being frozen in. It may be locked within the Bay of Wales. Here is the treacherous foe. If caught, the ships will be wedged against the barrier, crushed. Here will be the graveyard of the fleet. The Coast Guard icebreaker North Wind goes into action, ramming, back, ramming again to break up the crushing flows. Landing craft work frantically to loosen the ice around the ships so propellers may turn without shearing off. One by one, the ships are cleared, yet underway. Bird remains behind with 197 volunteers in grave problems. His most important exploration flights will now lack the powerful directional radio of the Mount Olympus. To get his men out, he must hope the icebreaker can crash her way back in time. Otherwise, he and his men will be frozen in for the nine sunless months of the dark, treacherous Antarctic winter. Marooned, Admiral Byrd and his staff plan the big flight to the South Pole and far beyond. This is the culmination, the last mass flight. Four planes spanning out over a continent of unknown territory larger than Texas, California, and Arizona combined. Over freezing wastes without people, without life, without vegetation. Nature's most formidable challenge to man. The four planes are gassed up. All controls triple-checked. Motors heated. For well, they face cold as extreme as 60 below, unrelenting, murderous. Photographic units lead the parade of science to the planes. Each is a flying laboratory. The cameras are the trimetrigons and the K-17s that spied out enemy secrets during the war. Now each plane carries 250 pounds of film to record some of nature's last great mysteries. The war's secret radar magnetic detectors are here too, bolted on like bombs. In war, their electronic impulses spotted minefields buried deep under the surface. Now they will read far below the ice, detect and identify minerals, coal, iron, precious ores. Bird gets the words, ready, sir. He boards the leading plane, gives the command, take off. Crews hasten to rock the ships and thus free the skis frozen to the ice. Now all the work that has gone before, the planning, the task of preparing ships, of training men, the perilous voyage through the ice, now all of these investments of time and sometimes of suffering are coming to focus. Takeoffs for non-stop flights over the desolate, danger-studded wastes of Antarctica. Flights of great distance, the equivalent of, back at home, winging non-stop from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Aviation is all important in the Navy's Antarctic exploration just as aviation is all important in a modern Navy that must be strong under and above the sea as well as on it. We'll be right back with... The shelf ice, Bird leads his four planes in the long climb over pressure ridge areas heading for the polar plateau, 10,000 feet up. Below are no landing fields, only deep crevasses. Pressure ridge is 100 feet high. Instant destruction for a plane forced down. Bird pioneered the first South Pole flight in 1929. He applies again the practice of constant vigilance, careful calculations that assured his earlier successes. Over this cruel country, Bird flies today at three miles a minute. In earlier explorations, three miles in one day was frequently the utmost for Shackleton and Scott for Britain, Amundsen for Norway, and Bird himself for America. The Beardmore Glacier, 200 miles long, 50 wide. A thousand feet deep, who knows? Bird checks position by the sun compass. The glacier signals the South Pole itself. Here, Bird drops the flags of the United Nations, carefully boxed, a symbol of America's goodwill to all nations. Now beyond the pole, Bird focuses his cameras and magnetic detectors on land new to him and to all mankind. In eastern group waters, the seaplane tender Pine Island swings out a plane. Listed on the fleet's roster as Mariner George One. Crew members look out. No shadow of coming disaster troubles their young faces. Captain Caldwell, observer. Lieutenant J.G. Frenchy LeBlanc, pilot in command. Lieutenant J.G. Bill Kearns, co-pilot. Ensign Lopez, navigator. And a crew of five take off to map the treacherous phantom coast.
Birds planes deep into the unknown are the eyes of civilization, recording, evaluating, mapping. Plateaus, mountain ranges with peaks 20,000 feet above sea level. The trimetric gun lenses clicking overlapping exposures every three seconds photograph from horizon to horizon. Coal, a mountain of coal. Bird later declares Antarctic mines, if once tapped, could supply the world's coal needs for centuries. These official motion pictures can give only a cross-section of the miles of photographic records accumulated on this expedition by the Navy. The exposed mapping film will take five years to assemble. Amplifying these are the radar magnetic detectors, accurately recording mineral discoveries of immense value for the future use of all mankind. England, Norway, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, South American countries, and Soviet Russia are claiming Antarctic territory. The United States recognizes no claim, and so far has made no formal claims for itself. But international policies cannot concern the Admiral now. His duty is to keep his flying laboratories functioning, to fulfill his dream of a lifetime. The word, gas half gone, sir, comes from the engineer tabulating fuel tank readings. Bird radios his pilots, return to base. By the third leg of their triangular course, the planes head back for Little America. Bird's plane takes the widest swing fuel permits as the lenses of the TriMets continue recording new territory. This is the last big flight. Bird is determined to record the maximum possible. One by one, the planes swing in over Tent City. Flight operations checks them in and safely down. Plane two, plane three, plane four. But not plane one. Bird's plane is yet to be accounted for. Bird is missing. Out over the ice, Bird is in trouble. His starboard engine is cutting out. Now stops. His one remaining engine is losing power. The altimeter needle starts dropping down. The plane is losing altitude. All 4D1 to base. All 4D1 to base. Position Q5. Engine out. Losing altitude. The base prepares for rescue operations. Handicapped by the partial power of one engine, the plane is in jeopardy. Down she drops. The needle drops from 3,000 feet down, threatening peaks around her. A further drop might mean a crash. Only one hope, reduce the load, lighten her at once. Maybe that way, maybe if enough weight goes, maybe she will hold. Already the mountains are above. She is deep in the valley, deep in the shadow of disaster. The needle drops downward from 1,700 feet. Jettison all gear. Precious films and records are saved. The gamble is life or death. The altimeter levels off at around 900 feet. Slowly she starts to climb. She is gaining altitude. Pilot signals, or oh. Three hours later, at the base, a crippled plane comes into sight. Men peer closely, tense, hushed, as they see the starboard prop dead. The one engine landing is tricky at best. With skis, on ice, hold your fingers crossed for the pilot. Save! Save! Good going! The greatest exploration flight of all history has ended in success. The flight beyond the South Pole. The flight beyond imagination. But over the Pine Island with the Eastern Group is the shadow of tragedy. Captain Dufek flashes the word by radio. To Eastern Task Group. From Task Group Commander. Mariner George 1, overdue. This group commenced standard search and rescue operations immediately. Grim men with grave news from Captain Dufek. No time now for jubilation over his own escape. No mood for rejoicing. Bird knows better than any man the tragic import of the message. 
In the freezing danger of the Antarctic, seconds are hours. Minutes are days. Every resource of the expedition must be mobilized instantly. All planes must take the air. All men stand alert for emergency duty. Over the ice pack, above the open sea, across the barrier. Mariner George 1 is down with men. No radio signals coming through. That means a crash. Search. 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 Wherever the plane is, it must be found. For maddening, anxious days, fog shrouds the area where the accident most likely took place. Men are frantic. Yet daily at their own request, at their urging in fact, the crew of the Pine Island gathers for prayer service. On the 13th day, the weather breaks clear. Captain Dupec sends another PBM into the area heretofore shrouded in fog. At last, in clear visibility, the pilots and men scan water and pack ice along the Phantom Coast. Wherever they are, the nine men of the George One have been lost almost two weeks. Hope is thin. Five hours out, Commander Howell, the pilot, spots smoke. A signal fire. Some are alive down there. How badly hurt? How many live? George One smashed. The wreckage scattered, some of it burned. And a message on the wing. Lopez, Henderson, Williams, dead. No seaplane can land on the ice. Can the survivors reach open water? Howell must drop a message. We'll land barrier's edge ten miles north. We'll drop flags to mark trail. If you can walk it, form circle. If not, form line. Howell knows the gravity of the decision Captain Caldwell must reach. But if the men can walk, a day may be saved. A precious day for the engine. Howell flashes the news. Captain Dufek gets the word and gives it to the Pine Island by loudspeaker. Attention all hands. This is the press group commander speaking. Mariner George 1 has been sighted. Rescue operations are in progress. Howell circles his PBM over the wreckage. He watches for his answer. The huddle of men breaks apart. They've reached a decision. It's a circle. They'll try the 10-mile trek to board the PBM at the water's edge. Howell's crew have the relief gear ready now for the men below. Cargo chutes float the heavy packages down. First aid boxes, rations, skis, blankets. For men hungry, cold, hurt, and losing hope, the chutes are as lovely as shining stars. Symbols of life restored, of return to families who've been waiting and praying. Now to mark the trail. The PBM's crew have hundreds of flags, each weighted to land and stay upright. If fog should again close in on this desolate coast, there must be no second disaster, no wandering from the road to rescue. The survivors follow the trail marker. Five able to walk, one on a sled, ten miles to go. These men are marching out of the shadow of death into the sunshine of life. Aboard the rescue plane, ready to leave the barrier edge, the survivors, six thankful men, jerk out their story in bits and flashes. How Henderson, Lopez, and Williams died in the crash and explosion when they smashed up in milk bowl disability. How they found scattered cans of food, stove, and fuel to keep it going. And one tube of sulfur tablets, just enough to keep Frenchy LeBlanc, their gravely injured pilot, barely alive. Proudly, they tell how Captain Caldwell consulted them all in dividing their little food, how he kept watch, inspired their faith, and how they prayed, as men always do, when there is no other hope but prayer. Bill Kearns, co-pilot, grins hello. First off is Frenchy LeBlanc. Corman carried him tenderly in a stoked stretcher. War and Robbins pulled him out of the blazing nose of the plane, but his back, hands, and face suffered third-degree burns, and in the Gethsemane of waiting for rescue, both legs were frozen to the knees. Amputation is inevitable, but he will live. The ship's company of the Pine Island greets their skipper, Captain Caldwell, observer on the flight. He says no ship ever looked so good to him as his own command, as again he sets foot on her decks. His executive officer greets him with sincere affection. Captain Dufek warmly welcomes the survivors. Co-pilot Kearns, his broken arm in a sling. McCarty, photographer. War, the radio operator. 
and smiling Shorty Robbins, the motorman. The head is warm, a hot bath, clean sheets, and long hours of restoring sleep. And perhaps first, a moment to splice the main brace, by which good sailors mean a ration of medicinal spirits, bourbon to you. Later in sick bay, all but Frenchy and Captain Caldwell enjoy their first full meal in two weeks. Kearns will go to Georgetown University to study for a career in diplomacy. McCarthy, who has a wife and two children in Sonoma, sunny California, beams happily. Robbins, who was the wheel horse in those desperate days, figures to keep on flying. He still loves it. And War knows that he will marry his school teacher's sweetheart back in Reading, Pennsylvania. News of the rescue finds the icebreaker with Admiral Cruzen fighting her way through thickening ice to pick up Admiral Byrd and his men at Little America. Byrd is radioed for all speed. At the base, the Admiral supervises Operation Secure. All essential records and scientific instruments are to be taken home. The planes must remain. They are stripped down with the hope that another American expedition in a future year may find them of use. Supply dumps are marked by poles. And now through the capes comes the old reliable workhorse, the icebreaker. Final loading is the order. All roads lead to the bay, the last trip down. The last long trek through the snow for the big go-devil sledges loaded with men and equipment. The excitement that always comes with sailing infects all hands, including the dogs. They sniff something important is in the wind. With normal quarters for 75, the icebreaker must jam aboard the additional 197 men of the base body until, after the voyage north, she can transfer personnel to the big ships awaiting her at Scott Island. Bird is among the last aboard. He can now report to Admiral Nimitz, Operation High Jump completed. Our men have achieved accomplishments unparalleled in the history of discovery. Our central group has flown far beyond the South Pole. Mapped one-third million square miles, never before seen by man. Our eastern group mapped 3,000 miles of phantom coast and charted 40,000 square miles of coastal ocean areas hitherto unknown. Our western group, flying hundreds of air hours, mapped the 4,000-mile sunset coast, made the amazing discovery of warm land in Antarctica. In all, the expedition explored more than a million and a half square miles. Our scientists, by use of the radar magnetic detector, have pinpointed fabulous treasures and resources of great significance for all mankind. The men who did the job, Navy, Army, Air Corps, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and scientists, are going home. Tired men. They're going home to their mothers, sweethearts, wives, children. Home, strong in the knowledge that they have met the Antarctic Battalions and conquered them.